Hi, I'm Peter Nowak, and you're listening to an excerpt from my upcoming book, Bombs, Boobs, and Burgers, How the Technologies of War, Sex, and Food Transformed Our World. This chapter is called Barbie's Worst Enemy, and here we go. The same wartime research into the chemicals that made up plastic also brought about big breakthroughs in disease control. American troops stationed in the Pacific Islands were vulnerable to a host of mosquito-borne diseases, including malaria, typhoid, and dengue. In 1944, Army Chief of Staff George C. Marshall instituted the first formal collaboration between the Department of Defense and the United States Department of Agriculture to search for a method of preventing such diseases from spreading. The USDA formed a medical entomology unit in Orlando, Florida, which demonstrated that dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane was able to kill disease-carrying lice and fleas. DDT, which had been invented in Switzerland by scientist Paul Hermann Müller in 1939, but never marketed commercially, was first put to effective use during the war in Sicily, where it contained an outbreak of typhus that would have otherwise sickened or killed thousands. Despite their usefulness, bug-fighting chemicals such as DDT were still difficult to disperse safely over a wide area. In 1941, Lyle Goodhue and William Sullivan, two USDA researchers, had a brainstorm. They decided to apply the principles of a flamethrower, a horrific new weapon, to combating disease. The flamethrower, which had been first been used, albeit sparingly, during the First World War, was widely adopted by all sides during the Second World War. The weapon was particularly useful against enemies entrenched in bunkers or caves. American soldiers, for example, used flamethrowers to burn up the oxygen in caves in which Japanese troops were hiding. Not surprisingly, the weapon had a scarring psychological effect, with troops often running away screaming at the mere sight of the flamethrower in action. The weapons generally relied on two tanks worn by soldiers as a backpack connected to a gun. One tank was filled with a flammable liquid, <coughs> usually gasoline, while the other held a compressed inner propellant gas, often nitrogen. The gas propelled the liquid into the gun, where it was ignited by a small flame or a heated wire, and shot out for its spectacular and devastating effects. Goodhue and Sullivan shrank the idea down, minus the ignition device, and in 1943 patented the aerosol spray can. The aerosol combined the two tanks of the flamethrower into one by pressurizing liquefied gas, and its first use was as the insecticide dispensing bug bomb in the Pacific Islands. After the war, aerosol sprays boomed as manufacturers used them for everything from co commercial mosquito repellent and air fresheners to cleaning products and hairspray. One of the first aerosols to hit the market was spray paint, invented in 1949 by pen painter Edward Seymour in Chicago. Following a suggestion from his wife, Seymour devised an aerosol propellant to, pr to demonstrate to potential clients what his aluminum-colored paint would look like when applied to their steam radiators. The clients were amazed by the spray gun, so Seymour borrowed a few thousand dollars to develop the idea. From there, his imaginatively named Seymour of Sycamore Company became a successful supplier of spray paint to hardware stores and paint distributors, while aerosols continued to creep into daily life through a plethora of uses. While aerosols changed the world for their better in their own ways, their respective downsides also inevitably emerged. In 1962, American biologist Rachel Carson, in her book Silent Spring, suggested that DDT and other pesticides were poisoning the environment and harming human health, a position endorsed shortly thereafter by a probe ordered by President John F. Kennedy. The book's publication was a seminal moment in the birth of the environmental movement and helped get DDT banned in the United States in 1972 and in many other developed countries afterward. At about the same time, attention was turning to aerosols and their harmful environmental effects. Mexican-born chemist Mario J. Molina and his American colleague Frank Sherwood Rowland in 1974 found that chlorofluorocarbons used as propellants in aerosols were eating away the ozone layer. Their discovery effectively uh, led to the worldwide ban of CFCs in 1989 by the Montreal Protocol and netted the duo the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1995. Aerosol makers have since replaced CFCs as propellants with a variety of different non-harmful chemicals, including butane, nitrous oxide, and dimethyl ether. Aerosols also had a much darker, destructive side. With boys being boys, it wasn't long before the aerosol's original military origins were rediscovered. 
By simply holding a lit match or lighter in front of it, the spray can was instantly transformed into a miniature flamethrower, much to the horror of many girls in their Barbie doll collections. That's it for this excerpt. Keep checking bombsboobsandburgers.com for more, and keep your eyes open for the book, available spring 2010.